So the queen of section eight is here with us today. I'm super excited, Jennifer. Thank you for joining us. I really was interested A mutual friend of ours connected us um, and you spoke to his group and I was really interested because I only have one section eight tenant like we were talking about earlier and he's like my favorite tenant ever. Um, like watches over my building and I actually just asked section eight for a rent increase on him so um that was something i've never done before he's been in my building for years so i kind of inherited him so i've never been in the process from the beginning so i guess if you can just introduce yourself and your experience and then kind of tell us a little bit about why you are the queen of section eight and why you love it so Jennifer Donnelly is my name. I'm in the St. Louis area. Um, I live on the in the far western suburbs and the properties that I own are almost all in what we would call North St. Louis County um, here. And I got my start with real estate investing in 2018. I really came to it at a point of kind of kind of desperation in my life. My husband and I own a, another business that wasn't doing well at the time. We've since turned that around, but I was really looking for another source of income, got in, you know, took a course, got into it and didn't take section eight. I had a few rentals, um, because I had heard all sorts of bad things about it. Like most of us do. And then in the middle of 2019, I bought a package of 12 occupied rentals and half of those properties had section eight tenants in them. And so once that happened and I was able, like you able to get some experience with it, I started to think, I don't think this has to be awful. Like everybody says it is. I, I, and it was really just a theory at the time, but I started to think, I think if you do this right, which for me doing this right is have nice properties, screen very thoroughly, be clear, firm, a good property manager and be very systematic and process oriented, which I am naturally. I think you can actually do this really, really well. So I started sort of testing that out. And that's really how I got here. So today I've got 38 doors. Most of those are single family. Maybe someday, I think April, you're in the multifamily space. Maybe someday I'll get more into multi. I have a few duplexes too, um, but I love my single families. And my plan is to get to hundred properties. My full focus is section eight. And um, there's really five reasons that I love it. You'll, if you kind of Google it, or if you Google it, you'll get you know a few that you'll find everywhere, which are things I love. The rent is guaranteed. Um, I get a nice big check from the government right into my bank account, you know, first week of the month. Um, and then the tenancies tend to be long because it's really a pain in the butt for section eight tenants to move. There's a lot of paperwork, there's timing involved. If they don't hit that timing and paperwork, they can lose their voucher, which is a very big deal because it's really hard to get. Um, so they tend to stay put. And I find that when my properties don't turn over, that's when I make money. So I yeah. like long tenancies. And then this is not always the case, but in pockets, if you can find these pockets, you can actually get a little bit higher rent than you would in market mm -hmm. for market tenants. Again, not always the case. We can talk more about what that looks like. So I do love those th three things, but the other two things I really like is there's some additional accountability for the tenants because they have to, you know, do certain things, make sure they're following the lease, all that good stuff, or they can lose their voucher. Um, and in fact, I, I do have some market tenants that I'm like, well, how do you manage these people? I don't have this extra, you know, piece out here to kind of hold them accountable. Um, but the other thing is, is that the supply and the demand gap, I mean, it's big and ev everywhere with housing right now, mm -hmm. but it is just enormous with section eight rentals. I mean, the demand so far exceeds the supply. And especially when you say, you know, the supply of nicer homes, there's just almost none out there for people with section eight vouchers. And so I put a property out for lease and I get a huge number of people that apply. So I'm able to really, you know, screen thoroughly and pick great tenants. Okay. Can I ask you some questions? Please. Okay. So when you're marketing, are you just like, um, can you send your property to section eight and be like, Hey, I have this property and it's available. If you know anyone looking, or are you doing like the traditional marketing, like putting it on Zillow and only taking section eight tenants, or are you doing like a combination of both? Yeah. Good question. So what's really interesting is section eight, while it's a federal program, it's administered locally through public housing authorities. So there are some, and I will get to your, but there's, this is like important background. Yeah. There's. 
some things that are going to be the same from, you know, town to town, area to area, but there are quite a few things that are different because the housing authority has some autonomy in how they operate. So some markets, yes, people go straight to section eight and they connect and, and find tenants, you know, through, through the agency or through the caseworkers or something there. But here in St. Louis, I just basically market like you would for market tenants, but I use a site called affordablehousing.com. It used to be go section eight.com. Uh, so I post there and I post on Zillow and that's it. Uh, Facebook marketplace makes me want to slit my wrist. Oh, so I oh, don't need to there. Me too. <laughs> I the worst completely ever. agree. And people got so up in arms when Zillow started charging. And I was like, I don't even care. I will pay no. Zillow charges all day long to not have to market on Facebook marketplace. Like it's terrible. terrible. It is. Yeah. It's horrible. It's just yeah. so much. And you can't automate it. So right. I use um, Show Mojo and it, my, my showing system is completely automated. I list it and I don't deal with it until I get applications. And oh, I definitely, just, I definitely want to hear more about that because we yeah. just started implementing something like that as well. It's the best. Um, but yeah, so I, anyway, I can't figure out a way to do that same thing without a human involved on Facebook marketplace. So that's the other thing. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, yes, then for me, I, I do list section eight only accepted for this property. Now this is really important. So, so federally, there is no law that prevents you from saying I only take section eight or I won't take section eight. It's called a source of income discrimination law, but there are, but some localities do do have that law. So check your city, county, and state if you're going to say, mm -hmm. I only take Section 8 or I won't take Section 8. Gotcha. That's good to know. Mm -hmm. So not everywhere you can just say Section 8 only. Right. So like for here, for instance, St. Louis County, we can say that, but in St. Louis City, we cannot. Okay. And I, and I know to some of the kind of more tenant-friendly areas tend to have, you know, a source of income discrimination law. Yeah. So. And then, so when you buy a house, how do you know what to ask for, for rent? Like if you're specifically marketing to section eight, is section eight coming through prior to you renting that house and like inspecting it or something? I've heard there's like inspections or are you just putting it out for rent first? And then when you place a tenant, they inspect or kind of how does that work? Process work. Yep. Okay. So before um, well, let me, let me tell you about the process and then I'll tell you about the rent, how I kind of estimate okay. rent before I buy or when I'm buying. Cause that's a big part of the process. So the way the section eight process works is you put a property out for lease, you, you know, show the property, however you would, you screen, however you would, although there are some things I do a little bit differently and we can talk about that. Mm -hmm. Um, you accept your tenant, you know, your applicant, just like you normally would. But then at that point, instead of signing the lease and all that stuff, there's paperwork that they're going to have. It's usually called the landlord packet. People call it differently, but let's call it landlord packet for our purposes. That's what we call it here. That paperwork gets done. We both have some things to do, me and the tenant. It's sent off to the Section 8 office. And then here, the way the process works is they schedule the inspection. They let us know pretty quickly after that what the approved rent amount is. And then the tenant is authorized to move in. Now, in terms of the rent, hmm, it's a little bit of a convoluted process. Okay. And again, each housing authority has some autonomy, but there's really two pieces to it. So first, you're going to want to look up what's called fair market rent for your area. So you can Google HUD fair market rent. HUD at the federal level sets like fair market rent or it's kind of like an average of a rent for of rents for a metro area. And that sets a ceiling for how much Section 8 can pay for a property based on the number of bedrooms in that area. So that's sort of your first test. The effect that that typically has is most Section 8 housing is in like B minus C and D areas because mm -hmm. you max out on the rents, unfortunately. That's a whole nother soapbox. We don't got time for that today. Mm -hmm. Second is they're going to compare it to market rents. So they're going to say, okay, you've asked this amount. It does not exceed the section eight, you know, allowable amount. 
but does it exceed what the comps support in the area for okay. rent? So what I do is I pop it into rent-a-meter or rentometer. I don't know how you say it. Mm-hmm. I run that address for the number of bedrooms I've got for one year back in time and a third of a mile around that property. And then that'll typically give me, you know, and what's nice is as long as you've got a one comp. So say you have like three comps, I don't know what rents are where you guys are. Let's say you've got three comps that are at a thousand and you've got one comp that's at 1200. You could probably get that 1200 again, as long as you're not maxing out the section eight rents. Mm-hmm. So that's how, that's how it's set. So you're kind of balancing the two basically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you are. And then when they come with their landlord packet, cause you're, you're filling out your rent on the landlord packet. So basically right. you're looking at those two things to see, I think I can get about this amount and that's what you're putting on the landlord packet. Then they submit that. And then section eight will come back and say, yes, we can give you this amount. Or if they can give you more, do they ever come back and say, no. So this is what I tell people all the time, shoot the moon on that initial rent. Because if you get the rent that you asked for, you did not ask enough. Okay. They're going to give you as much as they can up to the amount that you ask for. Ah, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And the same is true on rent increases. Yeah. I wish we would have had this call like two weeks ago. Cause I uh-huh. think I just made that mistake on my yeah. apartment building <laughs> where I have the inherited section eight tenant. And that was my next question is like with him. Um, I mean, he's been with me a couple of years and I've never like done anything or asked for an increase in rent. And I didn't just never really crossed my mind. And then what happened is section eight reached out to me to ask if he could add his girlfriend to the lease. And they wanted me to sign a paper. And I was like, well, before I approve like another body in my building using water and stuff, I want to like reassess his rent amount. Well, he's been with me for probably like three or four years and I've never done that. So I went back and was like, well, I can, I know I can get this much more for his apartment. I actually think I can get like this much more, but I came in like here and I probably shouldn't have, and they approved it like instantly. So then I approved for another person to live there. So they aren't necessarily like increasing the rent every year or increasing payments to you every year, right? You have to actively ask them. Correct. So that is something. So the process itself, again, is going to vary from one housing authority to the next, but every single Housing authority is going to have a process where you can ask for a rent increase once per year. And so, and here, and mo- most of the time, and who put it here in St. Louis, ours is 60 to 90 days prior to the renewal. Okay. So you can bet your ass that I never miss that window for <laughs> any of my properties. I just submitted three yesterday that renew July 1st. Okay. And again, every housing authority kind of handles that differently. Some of them will say we're not going to increase more than a certain percentage or a certain dollar amount. That's I've seen some make you do a little bit more legwork to prove why it's deserved, but a lot of them, including ours here, it's two pieces of paper. You send nothing else in and they either approve it or if they don't approve your amount, they'll tell you, you know, we can't approve 1200, but we can do 1150. Okay. So do you just have a system in place that kind of alerts you when your tenants are due for renewal. Yeah. So my property management system, I can change when it alerts me to renewals and Uh, I have mine alert me 90 days out. Okay. And And then I put a note on my calendar the first Monday of every month I submit. Okay. And what do you use currently like system wise? Are you self-managing or do you have a company? Nope. I self-manage. I probably always will. I do have an employee that helps me. Um, and she's is a godsend. Um, but the systems I use, so I use rent tech direct for my property management. I think I'll eventually switch to app folio once I'm over okay. 50. Yeah. And then, um, I use show mojo for self-showing. Okay. So we're going to come back to show mojo in a second. I just have another question about section eight rental payments. Cause I've heard like mixed answers to this question. And maybe again, it might go back to like the municipality. I'm not sure, but Does the entire rent payment have to come from section eight or can the tenant pay part of it? Portion. Yeah. So it's income based. So when somebody gets approved for section, when a person, like a tenant gets approved for section eight, they have to send in income paperwork showing pay stubs or whatever, however they, whatever income they have. And then they will pay 30 per, they'll calculate and 30% of their income will 
go towards their housing expenses between utilities and the rent. So most of my tenants have a portion of the rent that they pay. Okay. And that portion I have to collect directly from them, just like any other normal tenant. Okay. Um, and then the rest comes from the government, the direct deposit. Okay. But what's really nice is that if their income changes midterm, so say they lose a job, something, they have medical issues, whatever, and they used to have $2,000 a month and then they go down to zero, all they have to do is contact their caseworker and then they will readjust based on their new income, you know, middle, middle of the lease or whatever. Okay. So it's great. And what is the inspection like, like the section eight inspection on the property? Cause people seem to get kind of like in a tizzy about that. I mean, for us in the Northeast, like I'm based out of Pennsylvania and it doesn't worry me too much because we have code inspections, like all landlords, their properties get code inspected anyway. So like yep. someone's going through my properties regularly section eight or not. So for me, it, I'm like, what could they possibly pick out? That's not going to get picked out on a code inspection anyway. What are your thoughts on the inspections? Yep. So the way the inspections work, there's always going to be an initial inspection. And then from there, it's either going to be once a year or twice a year. And the housing authority will decide how they're going to do that. Um, and it just varies widely. I mean, there, there is a, a federal guideline and a standard, and you can even Google it and find the um, inspection form, but it really depends on the inspector. Sounds We have occupancy inspections here. sounds like you've got something similar yeah. and that's the exact same way. I mean, we have picky inspectors, we have really mm -hmm. easy inspectors, and I find that sex chain inspections are exactly the same way. Um, so sometimes people get um, upset about inspections if it's something that the tenant caught, if it's like damage the tenant caused or like, you know, there's no batteries in the smoke detectors. But I don't get upset about that stuff. We just fix it mm -hmm. and then we bill it back to the tenant. Because if we bill it back to the tenant and they don't pay it and they get evicted, they're going to lose their voucher. So they pay it. Mm. Okay. And is there any lag time between like um, a tenant comes and looks at a property, they decide they like it. So they give you the landlord packet, you fill out their portion, they fill out their portion, they send it back to section eight. Is there a lag time with section eight coming out to inspect or do you find the turnovers pretty quick? Again, it varies widely. Ours here from the time we turn the packet in to when they schedule the inspection runs about a week. Okay. So it's not bad. Um, our turn time runs about three weeks from the time we turn the landlord packet in to move in. So it's not awful. I mean, it can add a little bit of time, but it's not awful. Yeah. But again, I hear very wide variants across the country on that. And you, so I work with two different housing authorities here and ours will, you know, at times run a little bit longer, um, you know, especially through COVID and staffing issues and blah, 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 blah. Okay. So it can be annoying sometimes if, um, you know, if it's holding you up longer than if yeah. you had a market tenant. Yeah. And then your screening process, because I think with anything, including section eight, whether you're take section eight, don't take section eight, everything comes back to like your screening process. And you mentioned in the beginning how like you're really good at that and you love processes and systems. So what are you looking for in particular? Like when you're looking, I'm assuming you're having them fill out like your regular application Mm -hmm. And what are you looking for to say like, yes, I'd like to take this section eight tenant, but not this section eight tenant. Yep. So, um, I'm going to hit some things that might be a little different from just your market tenants. That's probably mm -hmm. like the best thing to do. The first thing is I want to get a copy of their voucher. So when they're eligible to move, they will get a literally a voucher and they usually probably have it electronically now, but you know, and it's going to say, who their section eight is through, so who their housing authority is, who their caseworker is, that's kind of important, but most important is two things. It's gonna tell you what unit size they're approved for. That's the number of bedrooms. It's really important. So for me, I require that they have a voucher unit size that matches the number of bedrooms in my property. Mm. Because if I take a two bedroom voucher in a three bedroom house, I'm gonna get paid rent as if it's a two bedroom house. Ah. So I'm gonna take a big hit on rent. So that's one. And then the other thing is I want to make sure that it's active because they have active dates. So they have a date that the voucher is issued and then it tells you the date that it expires. So they usually only have like four months to find a property, which should be enough, but it's really tough for them right now. Mm -hmm. And if you're outside of that window, they cannot move. 
Um, so it's not uncommon that I'll get vouchers that have the wrong number of bedrooms on them or that it's expired. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing that I'm checking. Um, I'm very, very thorough on getting all the documentation up front. I do require them to have some income. It's probably, it's been a little bit of a, um, tinkering for me on how much to, to require. And the more bedrooms in the property, the more income I require. So for me here, if it's a two bedroom, they got to have $1,200 a month, three bedroom, 1750, four bedroom, 2000 a month. Um, because that affects how much, because the rent is income based. Mm -hmm. If your section eight tenant has income, you can get more rent as long as you aren't going over that market amount. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's a benefit, but that's not why I require income. I started requiring income because I found that my best section eight tenants all had some income. I did like an analysis about 18 months ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I, I have some theories as to why that is. I think it probably boils down to if you have little to no income, your life is really difficult and you're having to make real tough decisions every single day. Mm -hmm. So you can't be all that concerned about is the lawn mode or the, you know, is landscaping taken care of or the gutters cleaned, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's why I started requiring income was because those were just my best tenants. Mm -hmm. Um, so I require income because a lot of times people that take section eight, I'll hear them say I, my favorite, I, I only want tenants that have their full payment coming from the government. Cause it's, that's fully guaranteed, but I had just found that those folks are often the most difficult to deal with. Ah, uh, okay. So I get all the documents up front. Um, and then from there I go through and do the same things you would, I call prior landlords. I do check their credit. I don't care so much about the score. But I am looking to see for the last couple of years, have you paid at least some of your bills on time? So if every account they've ever opened in their whole entire life went to collections, they're going to be a difficult tenant. Even if they pay, they're probably going to be late, right? It's just mm -hmm. going to be tough. So mm -hmm. then I decline them. Um, I'm trying to go through my, I have like a five page checklist. I'm going through it in my head. <laughs> um, you know, I check social media pretty mm -hmm pretty rigorously. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't allow pets I'm pretty firm on that. I think the rest of it is just the stuff that you would typically require of market tenants. Okay. Yeah, that's good. And that's good stuff. Um, so tell me a little bit about show mojo. I'm kind of asking this question. I don't want to say selfishly, but we just started using tenant Turner, uh, -huh. yeah. uh cause we're automating our whole showing process. Cause I'm like, there has to be an easier way. Like I mm -hmm. should not have to send a human body to my apartment to meet someone there to open the door. So how does show mojo work for you? I'm curious about that process. I love it. I feel like it changed everything. <laughs> so here's what I do. I list the property for lease on show mojo. And I have like five or six pre-screen questions because mm -hmm. I don't want people going through that aren't going to get the property. Right. Mm -hmm. So it asks, yeah. are you on section eight? How many bedrooms is your voucher for? What's your income? Do you have pets? Mm -hmm. Um, the goal being only people that are going to at least hit those initial qualifications are going to get in. Although you would be surprised. I can see sometimes people have filled this questionnaire out like 10 times until they figured out <laughs> how they need to answer <laughs> and they apply, then they're declined. I'm like, Oh my God. <laughs> A for effort though. <laughs> yes, I guess. Anyway, um, but they, so, so they go online, they find the listing, they fill out this little pre-screen and then they, they schedule themselves. They send in, this is all automated. I don't do any of this. It's all through Shomojo. They send in a picture of their ID. It auto scans to make sure it matches the data that they've sent in. Mm -hmm. And then they get a code. So I've got digital deadbolts on all my doors. Mm -hmm. They get a code that works for their time that they're supposed to be there. And then I leave paperwork on the kitchen counter that tells them how to apply. And that's it. It's amazing. It that's is amazing. amazing. A couple amazing. of things I do. I, um, I do put, I put a um, standard lockbox on the door and then I put like a laminated thing on the front door that says, you know, kind of 
does some initial troubleshooting if they can't get in, Mm -hmm. but it also gives them my phone number because probably eh, a quarter to a third of people have some sort of issue, Mm -hmm. whatever. And then the deadbolts, you know, the digital is not working. And so then I'll give them a, the lockbox code Mm -hmm. with a key. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that I have found is very helpful. And then I also put a simply safe security system in these properties. Now there's going to be a time where this is not scalable because it is a little bit of a pain in the butt. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I am a little nervous about is if these people leave a window open Mm -hmm. or something like that, and they come back after hours and Mm -hmm. steal a, I don't know, a fridge or move Mm -hmm. in or whatever. Um, Mm -hmm. I've not actually ever had that happen, but it's certainly Mm -hmm. a risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then I can turn off that security system, you know, turn it off in the morning and back on at night. Okay. That's interesting. I might have to add that extra level of security system. So we just started using tenant Turner and I, so far I love it. And I've heard stories from landlords, like it's good in some areas, but not all. Like I have talked to some landlords that have used it in like, um, Philadelphia and like lower income areas. And they're like, Oh, no way. Because they're the landlord tenant laws are not friendly in Philadelphia. So like basically a squatter has more rights than you do as a landlord. So they're like, (laughs) we've had squatter issues with it and stuff like that. So, um, so far we've not had any issues with it and I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just so much time savings and, um, yeah, I mean, it's amazing. I don't, I don't touch it. You know, they can call, they can text, they can email, but it's just totally. Yeah. Takes care of it. It's great. Yeah. And my properties are like in B and C areas and I have not had any issues. Now you're going to have stuff like door gets left, not open, mm-hmm. but unlocked lights mm-hmm. get left on the heats at 80 mm-hmm. stupid stuff like that. But still mm-hmm. my properties are like 45 minutes from where um, me and my staff live. So if we don't mm-hmm. have to drive there. I'll deal with all that. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so before I open up for questions, anything else you want us to know, like in general, this has been awesome. Thank you. I, I just love this stuff. Um, I'm going to chase a rabbit here. It's not section eight related, but it's something I like to share because I, maybe you guys are already like well-versed in all this, but something I did uh, almost exactly a year ago I, at the time I had um, 26 properties at my personal home and I keep them on a, port- on a spreadsheet and I realized I've got really good loan to value here. So I called my banker and I said, Hey, will you let me do a cash out refinance on all of these properties, pay off with the cash, pay off my house and my most valuable rental property, do a line of credit against those two. And now we've done that and I can fund all my own deals. Yeah. So I just wanted to share that because it's been really life-changing. I I don't have a house payment anymore and I'm my own banker now. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Thank you for sharing that. Mm What questions do you guys have? I'm going to open it up for questions. You can, I believe, unmute yourself or you can raise your hand and then I can unmute you. Does anyone have a a question? Yeah. Um, So is there any place or area that we can we can see Section 8 like um, payment per bedroom? And because I assume it's different from place to place and. Um, it is. So the first thing I would actually recommend, I didn't mention this earlier, but wherever you're investing or wanting to invest, Google, you know, the housing authority. So like for me, I would Google St. Louis, Missouri housing authority and go to that housing authority's website and see if you can find where they have listed their payment standards. And those will be listed by bedroom. And that's going to tell you the most that section eight will pay by bedroom you know, for that area or zip code. Now keep in mind, that's the most that section eight will pay. But if you have a tenant that has income, you can essentially tack on 30% of their income to that amount. So check there first. And then if your housing authority does not list their payment standards, Google HUD fair market rents, and then you can find your area. And then you can look for the same information by bedroom. Thank you. Yep, you bet. I have a question. So um, can you put the tenants on a month-to-month lease while signing the year contract with Section 8? Good question. You can, but I would not recommend it um, because 
a lot can happen, right? So the unit doesn't pass inspection and you think what they're asking is ridiculous. Um, so then you got a problem, right? Um, the rent comes back and it's hundreds of dollars less than what you're willing to take. I'm trying to think what else could happen. Those are kind of your two biggies. Um, when a tenant is authorized to move in, they're gonna get something, it's named different in different places, but they're gonna get what's called the move-in authorization. It tells you this, it's at the very end, this tenant is approved for this address at this rent and their portion is, you know, whatever it is, and it's actually, it's gonna pay the remainder. Um, and until you get that, it is a bad idea, in my opinion, to move them in because you're gonna be putting them in a unit that they cannot afford without section eight. And if something happens and they don't get approved for that unit one way or another, you're gonna to have to get them out. Okay, maybe I should have rephrased that differently. Um, I believe maybe my question was misunderstood. So okay. um, what I'm meaning is once they're approved for section oh, eight and uh -huh. you, you sign everything with section eight, you keep them on a month to month versus a year long lease. Mm -hmm. I was told here that that one year contract with section eight doesn't necessarily mean that they're locked in on a one year lease with you if you sign a month to month. So if you have trouble with that tenant, you can just give them the 30, 60 day notice and say, Hey, you got, you got to go not non-renewal of lease basically. And then they'd have to move. Is that how it works there? I'm sure it's different from that one is that one does vary. So ours here, they have to be on annual leases. Okay. Um, but chat, what you're going to want to look for is your housing authority is going to have what's called an administrative plan. It should be published on their website because it is public information. It's okay. probably going to be three to 600 pages, but somewhere in there, it's going to say what they require of the leases. Okay. That's helpful. Mm -hmm. That's a great question because I know a lot of, well, I know me, and like a lot of landlords I know in Pennsylvania, like I won't do your leases anymore. I'll only do month to month. Ever since the whole COVID government intervention thing, I want to be able to give my 30 days notice and they're out. And then yep. if they stay, I have, I can go to court and easily evict them. So I don't do your leases anymore. So that's definitely something that's worth like looking into. Yeah. If it yeah. yeah. But they, so can they... Per section eight, do they have to keep like the apartment in a certain condition or follow the landlord rules? And if they're not, does section eight intervene in any way? No, you still have your lease. They need to follow your lease just like your market tenants do. And then you can okay. still evict for violations just like normal. Okay. Um, section eight does not intervene. They don't pay for damages. Sorry, I got a dog on the move. It's okay. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, but if they get evicted while on Section 8, they will likely lose their voucher. So that does not typically, you don't usually get to that point for, right. for most of them. Not going to say okay. all, but for most. I've never had it happen, but I hear stories. Okay. MJ, you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Is it harder to evict a Section 8 tenant than a regular tenant? Are there more um, stipulations that you kind of have to go through? There are not here, but I have heard, especially in more tenant friendly areas, sometimes the local, the locality may have like additional rules and things like that. So the only thing here, we do have to give 60 days notice of non-renewal instead of 30 days if we're not going to renew somebody, but that's it for us here. Um, everything else is pretty much exactly the same, but check your, especially your local laws. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I have a question just kind of more direct for you um, yeah. as far as what's your what's your your big picture here as far as what are you scaling to what's what's your goal in mind? Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, 100 doors is my plan. Um, I plan to be there by 2026, although this market doesn't cool down, I might not get there quite that quick because I've got pretty tight rules for myself in terms of all in numbers and, and cash flow. So that's getting a little tight at times, but that's my plan. Okay. And then just to kind of piggyback off of that one, what is your, what, what are you looking for? You know, everybody's got their, you know, their model for what you're and And I follow another guy who um, is heavy section eight and we we've talked a good bit. Uh, his name's Tom Cruise. Not sure if you've come I across know of him. him, but I don't, I've not talked to him. 
Yeah, so we, we've talked, uh, you know, a good, good few times, and he has a very specific model that he follows um, for what he does. And just curious to, to what yours is, you know, his is, he, he only buys $100,000 under single families, two, two bedrooms, three bedrooms only, and primarily all of his properties are in North Carolina. What's kind of your, your model? What do you look for in houses? Do you have one? Oh yeah. I'm very tight on all. I've got this very long yeah, list, but for you, you guys said systems and everything. Yeah. So I think the same way. So I figured you did. Yeah. So there, for me, there's five school districts here that I will buy in. Um, so something I have found, I have some um, houses that are outside of those school districts that are not in as good as school districts. And while I found, I found that I can find in place good tenants in the lesser school districts, yeah. but I can't keep good tenants in those properties. So anyway, I've, I've got five school districts that I buy in. I like simple 1950s ranch properties that are a thousand square feet. My sweet spot is three bedroom. I'll buy a two if I can get the numbers to work, but I require one of my rules is I've got to have between two to $250 a month in net cash flow after PITI repairs, vacancy, um, reserves, um, trying to think here's something I'm learning right now. I do have a few four bedroom properties, like three or four. And the, um, demand is crazy because it's real. There just aren't that it's hard to find. I'm sure it's yeah. really hard for them to find, but I cannot, I'm having a hard time right now finding a tenant I can approve because these folks have got four, five, six, seven kids sometimes. Um, and so they're, they're kind of a mess. You know, they're just, their credit's really bad. Their prior landlord references are really bad. <laughs> and so I'm just having a hard time finding a tenant to approve. So I, I don't think I'll buy any more four bedrooms. Or if I do, it's going to need to be at three bedroom numbers. Got it. Awesome. And, and that kind of, you know, sorry, if anybody has any questions, just cut, just cut me off. Um, but, you know, that does, you know, from what you're saying, I can see, a little bit more of your, your avatar, right? You have a yeah. very specific avatar. And just as, you know, a lot of people think about section eight is that negativity, right? Just like you spoke on, whereas you've removed that, right? You've created an avatar that doesn't fit that negative stereotype that has created the successful business. So I, uh, that little piece of value right there is, is big. Thank you. Yeah. You know, one of the big things for me is I always say, I want to have one of the nicest houses in the neighborhood. You know, we're not putting in granite and stuff like that, but it's going to be, it's going to look modern. It's going to be clean. And yeah. then when I list the property, I don't, my first, I, first of all, I do professional photos and the first listing picture that's kind of the, you know, the advertisement is the best interior photo that I have, which is usually either the kitchen or the living room. And so then I'm able to attract them, you know, right out of the gate. And I find that that really works well. Awesome. And I think that's why they, my folks stay a long time. Well, partially anyway, because they're in the best unit that they can find. So yeah. they're not going to go anywhere. I'm assuming this is like probably a fair housing law act question, but if someone's applying for like a two or three bedroom place and they have like five or six kids, I guess section eight, it's neither here nor there to them. They don't tell them like you need a four bedroom or five bedroom. They do. They do. It's they based do. on how many kit, how many occupants I should say that they have. Okay. And again, every housing authority has some autonomy in setting that. So what really ends up happening is if they want to serve the most people, the housing authority wants to serve the most people, they will get really tight on how many people they put. I mean, they'll put, it's like, it, it's like, so the, the thing I hear sometimes is two heartbeats to a bedroom. Okay. doesn't matter sex, that, you know, age, whatever, okay. but here it's more like little kids under five are going to be two to a bedroom, older kids over five, different sexes, different bedrooms. So most of my three bedroom folks have got, um, you know, three to five occupants, I have a few with five occupants. Um, and then you most, I don't have, I only have a couple of two bedroom properties and they've usually got, it's usually like a parent and a child, or maybe a parent and two children. So it does, you know, the more, the more units they're approved for means the more occupants that they're going to have. Okay. And if they're approved for like a four bedroom voucher to section eight, are they okay with letting them rent a three bedroom home or do they need a four bedroom home? 
they will let them rent a, a three bedroom. Okay. I typically don't allow that because it's usually just too many people Okay. for the property. So my rule is it's your unit size has to match the bedrooms Okay. and the property. And the other thing is sometimes people that have like a four bedroom voucher will get desperate. And so they'll take a three bedroom, but what they don't tell you is they're going to keep looking for that four. So they're going to be gone uh, in a year. Gotcha. Okay. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. MJ, go ahead. Oh, I was just wondering, do you have an additional, um, you know, a quarterly inspection on top of the annual inspection that Section 8 does um, for your properties? Yep. We do inspections twice a year, typically late spring and late fall. I like that because I'm able to spot um, like gutter because I require our tenants to um, clean out the gutters. Either they do or they hire it out. Doesn't matter. Um, so we can spot that, you know, hoses that are still hooked up in, in late fall, things like that. So we do those twice a year and we tell the tenants before they move in, this is going to be happening. The, oh, the other thing is on the screening, I do this for everybody. This is not different for section eight because I do have a few market rentals. Uh, I do a home visit. I don't know if everybody does that or not, but I do a home visit at their current residence. And the verbiage I use is to verify that you take reasonable and normal care of your current residents. Mm. That is a screening game changer. Yeah, I've heard that. Um, I think one of the other JS Moa, he also does that. Yeah, um, he yeah. does too. Yeah. I, um, I, I feel like that's kind of like a trend. Um, and I would bet five to 10 years from now, most landlords or property managers will do that because, you know, sometimes you can get all the data in the world, but you can't tell if the place is taken care of or not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And how do you find applicants take that um, when you do require that? <laughs> so that's a great question. I'm really transparent right out of the gate. So the paperwork that they pick up at the house when they come to look at it tells them our screening criteria. And the, it says on there, we do this home visit. Um, and then of course, towards the end of the screening. So usually when we do a home visit, they're approved, but not always, probably 80% of the time I approve them at that point. But anyway, then I just call them and schedule it. And I would say almost all of them are fine with it. Don't even flinch or have any issues. Once in a while, I have somebody, um, you know, that won't like it, or I got some feedback. This was on a market rental actually, uh, here a little bit ago, a couple weeks ago, I don't know, a few weeks ago, whatever. And she said, you know, the feedback I got, cause you, cause show mojo collects feedback for you, which is great. And the feedback was your screening process is ridiculous and so intrusive and blah, blah, blah. And that's okay. Like I get it, but you're not going to rent my property. It's yeah. okay. They're not a good match for you. Yeah. No Weed problem. themselves out. That's perfect. Yeah. Don't waste your time. I won't, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. You have to be so diligent with screening. I mean, like in our area, the it's insane. The amount of people that like between fake paycheck stubs, there's literally sites that are like making fake paycheck stubs. And there's also, um, tons of people who are like, Oh, my landlord's selling the house. And then the landlord name doesn't match the name that owns the house in public records. The house isn't for sale. They can't furnish a lease showing that they actually lived at that house. I mean, it's, I feel like I'm a private investigator half the time. It's crazy Yeah, on income. This is, this is huge too. There's a, a, um, a website or a program, whatever software called the closing docs. Okay. It is amazing. So you send it to you. It's part of your screening and they get an email. They enter their bank account info. This is all of course encrypted and whatever. And then it pulls the deposits in their bank account for the last 12 months. And it summarizes it for you, who it's from, how much, what's recurring. So it is, they can't fake it. It's awesome. There's a large property management firm here that I turned onto it and they have just, just started using it and they've quit requiring pay stubs because they don't need them anymore. Wow. That is gold. That is gold right there. 10 bucks per person. It's like nothing. Wow. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. It will change your life. Sorry. What was it called again? I missed it. The closing docs, the closing docs, D-O-C-S. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then I, I found it because it's attached to rent tech has like a partnership with them. So it's attached to my property management. And I was like, oh, I'm going to add this on and see what happens. And it's awesome. Someone else had a question. I just lowered your hand and now I lost you. I lost you. I don't know how you say it, but I think it was Prince, Prince, Princey. Investment. Hey, how you doing? 
Good. How are you? Hey, how are you doing? Hey, how are you doing? My name is uh, Prince. Prince. Um, the question that I have is in regards to um, what are your thoughts as to out of county uh, personnel? Because I've been uh, renting to Section 8, but I've had um, personnel from different counties, uh, from Philadelphia or other counties, um, requesting um, uh, occupancy or to get approved for Section 8 in, in my county. What are your thoughts in regards to, to that? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I'm following the question. Can you give me a little bit more or rephrase it? Um, I'm currently in Schuylkill County, but I've been having a um, request from, from uh, personnel uh, wanted occupancy, um, but they're not from the Schuylkill County area. Ah. So a lot of the times the vouchers uh, that they have are from out of, out, out are of not area. from Schuylkill County. So sometimes they have like an open voucher or they have to transfer the voucher. What are your thoughts in regards to those types okay. of uh, requests? Gotcha. So for me, our folks have got to bring a voucher from either St. Louis City or County Housing Authority because my properties are in St. Louis County. That's the only two places that will take, you know, that I can place them in my property and they'll, they'll pay me for. So if they were to come to me from like a, surrounding county, I would just say, you know, sorry, but you've got to have a voucher from one of these two places. And then it's up to them to figure out it's called, they can port it or portability is what it's called. I think when they move from one housing authority to another, um, I would just tell them you're going to have to figure that out. Am I answering your question? Yes. But I was question. wondering, do you, would you, would you recommend, would you recommend it? Because um, there are quite a few people that are trying to move from the Philadelphia I see. cities and they're coming to like places like uh, Schuylkill County and Berks County um, and they're requesting the transfers. Um, they've been on the waiting list for quite some time. So I was wondering if you think uh, that it's, uh, do you see any, any um, turnover rate when, as in that regards, but sometimes- Oh, people wanting to move. Would be a high turnover rate? So just so I'm clear, wanting like, like people in my units wanting to move potentially to another area, or you're saying if you take those folks, they might want to move later because they want to move back out. Is that what you're asking? Yes. Do you okay. Find them wanted to move back out, to move back or leave, um, are they staying longer or because they're not really familiar with the area, they're just moving to the area just because to get approved for the section eight. That's a really good question. I'm not sure I've got a great answer. Um, here, what ends up happening is they really can't find a unit in where they want to be. And that's probably not going to change, unfortunately. And so they do tend, I mean, I, I just haven't had any, I've had some people that have ported, but I, I haven't had any turnover, you know, with those folks, um, I would probably do some digging. So one of the questions that I ask on my application is how long do you plan to stay if approved in the unit? And if they say one year, 12 months, something like that, I will just call them and say, Hey, I had a question. I noticed you said you plan to stay for a year. Where are you planning to go after that? So I do kind of like the assumed close kind of thing, right? Where are you going? Not, are you going to really stay only a year? Um, and then I find I get a good answer and they'll tell me, oh, I'm hoping to move back out to blah, blah, blah County, or, you know, my family's in California. I get that one a lot. Everyone's moving to California, but they never, they never go by the way. I've had probably half a dozen people tell me they're going to move somewhere nicer and warmer and no one has done it yet. So I, I don't know that that's kind of like a non-answer, but I have not had, I just, I have almost no turnover with my section eight tenants at all. Thank you very much. Great questions. Trisha, go ahead. Hi, I'd like to thank both of you for your time today. Uh, a lot of great details. I am looking um, for different apps uh, or websites or things that you found helpful for you. April, I heard you say, is it Tenant Turner? Mm -hmm. Tenant Turner um, is what we use to automate like our showing process and Jennifer uses show mojo and they sound very similar, like very, very similar. 
it's like an automated lockbox or an automated lock for tenant turner we have like an uh lockbox where like tenant turners changing the code like virtually for our tenants and there we give them pre-screening questions to tenant turner so they make sure everyone meets the pre-screen criteria then they schedule a time for them to go out and look at the property so tenants are basically self-showing yeah that's so much fun is there other applications that you both are using um she said about the closing docs as one too yeah so i'm gonna start using that because like my biggest problem i have now is people like faking that they work somewhere like their information isn't on a pay stub so i'm going to add the closing docs as like a pay stub verification but then i use mysmartmove.com to do credit and background checks and same as jennifer like i'm not looking for perfect credit but i'm looking to make sure they pay their bills like and my smart move has like this color coded system so you're not like analyzing their credit report it'll literally show you like they didn't pay on this card for the past three months so i recently had an applicant who um told me that her landlord was selling and they only gave her three weeks to move and she applied for my apartment um could not verify for me that she lived where she said that she lived and then i did pull the credit check on her and for the past three months she hasn't paid any of her bills which shows me that something is going on in the past three months in her life that she's probably being evicted and is just telling me that her landlord's selling the landlord's house wasn't up for sale the landlord would not contact me back like nothing um so i use my smart move for credit background and eviction checks i'm going to use the closing docs now to verify bank deposits instead of pay stubs and then i'm do still you, go ahead sorry do you like the my smart move more than i was using apartment.com i've never used apartments.com for credit background or eviction i i think it used my i think it was originally the cozy mm, yeah i've never i never used them either like i've always used uh my smart move and then i, I always cross in Pennsylvania, we have the UJS portal. So I always cross check evictions in the UJS portal in case they don't show up on my smart move. So it's ujsportal.pacourts.us. And I can see if anyone's been evicted in there. So I always do a cross check just in case my smart move misses anything. Or sometimes the eviction was just filed and it's not picking it up for some reason. What was that again, April? I'm sorry. Uh, UJS portal. I'll type it in the chat. Thank you. And then my smart moves who I use for credit and background. And that's $40 per adult and they pay that on their own and it verifies all their information. And then Jennifer saying she uses the closing docs to verify pay stubs. So I put all that in the chat for you guys. And then I'm sending them my application and I do the same thing Jennifer uses, does like, how long do you plan on living here? And I, I have like check boxes, one year, two year, three years. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to share my application with anyone, but I'm gonna tell you that I'm not an attorney and you need to have a check by an attorney and it doesn't necessarily fit your state requirements and you shouldn't use it but you can look at it and have your attorney draw up something based off of it <laughs> i can't promise you aren't going to get sued right get sued. yeah disclaimer <laughs> <laughs> um i'm trying to think if i get any other like gold um and apartments.com is who i use to collect rent on all my units right now and they switch over from cozy and when they switch over some people are like oh my gosh i hate apartments.com i love them like i don't have any issues with them i didn't have any issues during the transfer and i still don't have any issues so i like it my tenants can do set up auto pay and i find out when they set up auto pay sometimes if they are a good ten tenant that goes bad they forget the auto pay set up so they're automatically paying me anyway even though they've like uh broken their lease and moved out early or something so yep yeah. um i had a couple things so i use rent tech direct for my property management that's end-to-end -end 
um, work order management, they can pay renewal management, you know, lease management, but there's also a really good one called schedulemyrent.com. Um, and I actually use that for one thing and one, th you can use it for like full property management. It's, it's nearly free, but they have a system where your tenants can pay in cash at MoneyGram locations. And mm -hmm. then that cash gets deposited, of course, into your account. Cause I was tired of waiting on money orders and I was not going to go pick up cash from people. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. And then I use mighty call for my phone management. Um, it's just an online VoIP system. Um, we really don't use it much for calling a little bit, but more we use it for text messaging. Yeah, so, so that one is, I can put those in the chat if that's helpful. Let me pop those in. Systematize or your business will run you. I hear a lot of people say like, I can't make my tenants pay rent online. They're older or they're low income or they're this, that. I'm like, I've legit driven tenants to the bank and helped them open a bank account. And all my tenants pay rent online and I will not have it any other way because then my business just runs me. Rents are coming in at all different times, all over the place. It will drive you absolutely insane. You cannot scale when your business is running you and you're not running your business. So I simply, when we made the switch, told my tenants, unfortunately, this is the way our business is going. If it's not a fit for you, I completely understand. All you have to do is give me 30 days written notice and you are more than welcome to move out. So, and nobody likes turnover. I obviously didn't want to lose anyone, but I, and I didn't lose anyone because I was kind of like, I'll do whatever it takes to help you. Like I'll set up, you want up on auto pay if you don't have access to the internet so you don't have to worry about it like i'll come out with my ipad and set you up i'll drive you to the bank to set up a bank account like but this is where things are going so yeah and i think it's hard to charge like late fees if you're not using some kind of a system like apartments.com because yeah. they, they don't pay it like oh that's just super messy yeah, so, so messy yeah anyway agree. And then Mary Jane, I know you've asked about the screening checklist. So I do um, some coaching and I, the screening, my five page screening checklist is something that I do hold for just um, for my clients. So. Oh, good. Where can people find more information about you, Jennifer? Cause we've taken up an hour of your time now. So. Yeah. I love this stuff. I could talk all day long. Um, so I've got a website. It's section eight educate.com. The eight, the number I'll put that in the chat too. Yes, please do. Um, and then you guys are welcome to, I'll put my email to, like I said, I love this stuff. Um, I, hold on, let me pop that in. But why? Um, sure. It's right. Yep. And then I do have a YouTube channel, section eight educate. And I talk, and it's very low, um, low tech. It's just, I think it's something that I think would be helpful. I do a video about it, um, but it's mostly section eight oriented. I, I do a fair number of things kind of like on site. So I've actually got a video about how I set up my automated showing system. Awesome. Um, you guys can check that stuff out too. I've got more about tenant screening and so. Awesome. So section eight educate on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And then section eight educate.com. Yep. Awesome. Give her a follow on YouTube y'all and click like, and subscribe. We're going to put cross post this video. So I'll send it to you so you can post it as well. If you want to, I really I appreciate that. your time today, Jennifer. This was like a download wealth of information about section eight all at once. It's a lot, but it was really good. Really I'm so good. glad. Thanks for uh, reaching out. I know I had said I'd love to chat more about it. I just, like I said, I just love the stuff you guys would so never hesitate to to reach out if you've got like a, a one off question or something like that, because awesome. it's just fun. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you all for coming. Okay. Have a good day. See you guys. See ya.